Thanks so much, Roy, Rick, for arranging this. Great to be here today. Great to have a chance to share with you some of the information that I have um, discovered, uh, put together. I've really been studying this topic as a scientist. So this is what I do. I'm a professor of psychology at UC Davis. I've been there for, uh, be starting my 26th year uh, next month. So it's only though been for the last 10 years that I've been pursuing the topic of gratitude or gratefulness as a research topic, trying to understand what it is, uh, why it matters for people individually as well as collectively, for example, in families, neighborhoods, organizations. Uh, and then uh, assuming it does matter, and, and I think it does, and hopefully I'll convince you of that if you're not already convinced, how to get more of it. How can we create a culture of gratitude within our own lives as well as in larger settings, contexts that we find ourselves on a regular basis. So uh, you do have a handout in front of you. You don't need to refer to that handout uh, as we move through the material today. That's really just for you to take with you, just so you have. What I usually find is that after a talk, maybe two people out of a hundred will say, you know, I would like to have that uh, presentation. You know, can you email it to me? So uh, instead of doing that, uh, we have it in a handout form. Take that with you. Uh, there's also some, also some other information toward the end of it. I'll refer to that as we move through the presentation uh, today. Okay, well, there's a saying that you can take the professor out of the classroom, but you can't really take the classroom out of the professor. So I'm going to start with a quiz today. All right, now don't worry, I won't grade you. Actually, I did that once on the first day of class. Uh, you know, I've been teaching now for a long time somewhere around 12,000 students I added up one time. And the biggest challenge is what to do on the first day, you know, because you want to make it seem interesting, but not too interesting, because then they think it's easy. They tell all their friends to sign up for the class, and the class is already too full. So actually, you want to make it sound hard so people will drop, right? And so, so uh, they don't get too confident, you know? So uh, one year, I gave a quiz on the first day, and I counted it toward their final grade. And the score was terrible. It was like 50%. Uh, you know, so it was the worst teaching evaluations I ever got that quarter is when I did that. So I don't do that anymore, but I'll do that today with you guys because I know you're friendlier than, and more forgiving uh, probably than some of the undergraduates that I teach. All right, so I've got several questions about gratitude uh, to help us start to think a little bit, process this concept and what it is and why it matters and how frequently do people engage in grateful behavior and grateful expressions. All right, so uh, you can mark it down on your hand or just think about it in your mind as we go through these. All right. Earlier this year, a national survey of over 2,000 persons was conducted in the United States that gave us a pretty good glimpse of gratefulness in America. Who is grateful and who expresses it and where is it expressed? And it involved all sorts of people in different ages, different socioeconomic uh, groups, different locations around the country. So the answers to this quiz come from that large sur survey. All right, question number one. We'll go through this uh, seven questions, and then we'll go back and we'll answer them and see how you did, all right? Question one, which of the following are people least grateful for? All right. Would that be family, friends, freedom, or fellow workers? All right, so think about how you would uh, answer that. Number two, of the following, who is least likely to be thanked by others? Wait staff in restaurants, bosses, spouses, or TSA screeners? Which of those four would be least likely uh, to be thanked? I see you got some ideas already. All right, number three, in which setting are people least likely <coughs> to express gratitude at home, in church, in restaurants, or in workplaces? All right. Number four, of the following, which age group expresses the least gratitude of these four options? Okay. 18 to 24 year olds, okay, so the youngest people of this four. 25 to 29, 70 to 74, or 50 to 54. So out of these four choices, in your opinion, who expresses the least amount of gratitude? All right, now we have three true and false to wrap up the quiz. 
Number five, women are more grateful than men. Is that true or is that false? Okay. Uh, number six, most people say that gratitude levels are declining compared to 20 years ago in the United States. And number seven, <clears throat> excuse me, number seven, according to a recent Gallup poll, 50% of people say they don't feel appreciated at work. They don't receive gratitude at work. All right, so you got guesses for each of those? All right, let's see how you did. Okay, which of the following are people least grateful for? And I bolded the correct answer. Uh, fellow workers, right? People are more grateful, express more gratitude toward family, friends, okay? Uh, it is, in fact, people are actually, they're asked, um, how grateful are you for your current job? And so I've kind of uh, extrapolated a little bit from that. I go from current job to fellow workers because fellow workers are part of one's job, of course. And uh, so that would, so if you answer D to that one, Congratulations, good job, you got that one. All right, number two. Of the, this one you got already, I could hear you murmuring after I gave you the options. TSA screeners uh, were thanked in the survey. Wait staff in restaurants, especially nice restaurants, 58%. Uh, TSA screeners, uh, only 22% of those received thanks, All right? Uh, bosses, it was said that 35% of bosses never receive uh, any thanks from their employees. So it would be TSA screeners. We're not so grateful for them. Okay, which setting are people least likely to express gratitude? Home, church, restaurants, workplaces. You start to see a little theme here. All right, bosses, workplaces, fellow workers, not so much gratitude going on. All right. Who expresses the least gratitude? I think you got this one also, right? Uh, younger individuals, younger persons seem to be more gratitude challenged uh, than uh, older. In fact, it's the group C of these four has the highest amount of gratitude, at least feel more comfortable in expressing it, which is kind of interesting. All right. Women are more grateful than men. Is that true or false? True. They are. Uh, any way you slice it, any way you measure it, uh, by looking at expressions, by looking at what they say about themselves, by looking at how they view gratitude as an emotion. Men are less likely to say that it's a useful emotion, that it's a constructive emotion. In fact, many men say that gratitude makes them feel embarrassed to have to express gratitude, so they have more negative attitudes toward it uh, than do women. So you can get an idea, right? If you're working with 18 and 24 year old guys and you want some gratitude, like forget about it, right? <laughs> you're not gonna get it. You're just not gonna get it. Okay. And as a father of a 16 year old, I can tell you that, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's, it's few and far between the expressions. Most people say that gratitude levels are declining compared to 20 years ago. That is true. Whereas most people actually uh, say that. But it's quite interesting, okay? Uh, only 19% said it's as high or higher, but when people are asked about their own expressions of gratitude, 88% say that they are now more grateful themselves than they were in any time in the past, three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So we think other people are less grateful, but we think we are more grateful, right? Which can't be, it can't work out that way, it doesn't make sense, not logical, right? But actually, it's the way that uh, the mind has been shown to have this bias. That is, we interpret other behavior, other people's behavior far more negatively than our own. So uh, it's an interesting bias. And then the last one. According to a recent Gallup poll, 50% of people say they don't feel appreciated at work. That is actually false. Uh, the number is 65%. Uh, that's right. Thank you. So it's two out of... Uh, three. Okay, so you see we have an interesting situation here that is most people say that they are grateful uh, but yet it depends upon the context. Uh, in terms of work <laughs> context, workplace gratitude seems to be very low compared to other settings. People say they want to be more appreciated 
uh, on their jobs. I have some data on that as well. That um, this is quite uh, interesting, uh, in fact. Well, we'll get to that uh, shortly. But there does seem to be a big discrepancy between what people say they want, what people are hungry for, and what they actually receive uh, on the job in terms of gratitude, in terms of appreciation. Well, I've been studying this topic for roughly 12 years now. And one conclusion that I've reached, and, and I stated in this particular uh, slide here, is that there's a power inherent to gratitude. That gratitude has the power to heal, to energize, and to change lives. All right. Now, that's a significant statement. And it's not one that we could make very lightly, especially in research settings where we got to have evidence. You got to have proof. You got to have numbers. One of the subtitles for this talk was putting numbers to the science of gratitude. And the science of gratitude is fairly new. It hasn't been around that long. And we're just starting to understand the ways in which gratitude has this power to heal, to energize, and to change lives. And that's what I want to share with you. Uh, today. The book that Roy mentioned, Gratitude Works, is a more pithy way of saying this, that gratitude does, does in fact bring about what it promises to do. Right? The question is how, in what ways? How can we derive some of these benefits individually as well as relationally in the context in which we find ourselves, whether it's home, whether it's in the workplace, uh, in schools, in our neighborhoods, and so on. That's what I've been trying to uncover through my research over the last 10 years. All right, here's a list of some of the positive effects or benefits of gratitude. And it's just a partial list. There are more than this, but there's as many as I can fit on one slide and too many to remember. So they include but aren't limited to when people practice gratitude, and we'll talk about what that means. How do you practice gratitude like you practice golf uh, or the piano? Uh, how do you actually put into practice gratitude or make it work? Well, when people do, they report higher levels of energy, alertness, attentiveness, enthusiasm, uh, for example. They report they're more successful in achieving their personal goals. They feel a stronger sense of purpose, a stronger commitment to working toward goals they've identified just by also feeling grateful at the, si at the same time. They cope better with stress. Their sleep is better, more efficient sleep. We found that people are practicing gratitude. They sleep longer per night. Now, not 16 hours, right? but it's about 12% uh, improvement in sleep duration as well as sleep quality. They wake up in the morning. They feel more refreshed, more alert, more alive, more awake. Right? They wake up fewer times in the night, what they call little micro awakenings. You know what that is? You kind of wake up. Uh, you look around. You look at the clock, see what time it is. You realize I better get back to sleep because I have to get up pretty soon. So that's a little micro awakening. So when you're keeping a gratitude journal as one type of practice, you do less of that. The sleep is, is more effective. Sleep quality is higher. What else we find? We find people feel better about themselves, have a greater sense of self-worth and self-confidence when they are practicing gratitude. Right? It seems like it's, it's, it's the key to, that opens all doors when you look at some of these uh, benefits. People become more generous, more helpful. They become more giving, more forgiving when they are practicing gratitude. So not only feeling better, but they're also doing better, doing good things for other people. Okay. Gratitude is, is interesting because it helps prolong enjoyment. When something beneficial happens to us, we receive a compliment from others, we get a raise, uh, a good thing happens. When you feel grateful for it, it magnifies that good feeling. Problem with good feelings and happiness, and there's a whole science of happiness that's been around about 25 years now, has shown that good things wear off. Newness wears off. We like newness. We like surprises. We like novelty. You can get a pay increase, and then that feels good for about a week or about a month. You get a new car, right? How long does that feeling last? Way less than the car payments, right? Yes, you're lucky if it could last as long as the car payments until uh, you get the first scratch, probably. Is when it usually wears off. So we adapt. Our emotional system is wired so that we adapt to good things, to, to pleasant events. Well, it would be great if we could delay that adaptation so that we don't have to go get that new car, new house, new spouse, etc. Right? And one way to do that is to practice gratitude. 
greater sense of resilience and a sense of purpose. I mean, the, the benefits are numerous. In fact, they're almost too many to mention. They occur in every domain in life, from the emotional to the physical, people exercise more, to, um, to the relational, to the spiritual. People report becoming more loving, forgiving. They feel closer to God, and so on. A wide range of benefits of the practice of gratitude. We put together this uh, infographic. Let me see. I was, I was watching to see which one was the middle light. That was the one. All right. Uh, to express some of these findings in a more uh, pictorial sense. If you're like me, you remember pictures uh, more so than words. And so we find that gratitude is good because of some of these reasons. Work, community, psychological health, you know, there's evidence that happy people, their income level is roughly 7% higher than people who are less happy. They've done these studies over time showing happiness at time one predicts how much money you will make five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. Well, it turns out gratitude is a driver of happiness. So it's not a stretch to say that gratitude will also improve one's level of uh, income. Grateful people have a stronger sense of community, feel more connected to others in their neighborhoods, in their communities. Uh, Health-related findings. Grateful people do better with stress. They have fewer stress-related illnesses. Their blood pressure is actually lower. There's studies showing that gratitude can reduce blood pressure as much as some of the more popular medications for reducing blood pressure without the side effects. Right. Uh, there's a lot of studies on gratitude in youth and teenagers, and we're doing some of that research right now, finding that grateful teenagers have advantages which range from academic, higher grade point averages, greater satisfaction with their school experience, with their home life. Uh, they're less likely to engage in harmful behaviors, health damaging behaviors like smoking, for example, less likely to get involved in fights at school, less likely to carry weapons uh, to school, all of which are associated with, with gratitude. There's research on uh, countries around the world based on hundreds of thousands of people who've been surveyed. There are certain countries which are more grateful uh, than others, which is kind of interesting. Uh, what else do we have? Giving to charity. Grateful people on average give more which is kind of interesting. Why would that be? Gratitude is receiving, but then gratitude also impels and compels and motivates people to give back in some measure to which they've received and continue to be uh, receiving. So a wide variety of benefits from the practice of gratitude. Now, all of this can be applied to organizations as well as to individuals. About a, a decade ago, in fact, 2003, uh, a movement began known as positive organizational functioning or an academic field, positive organizational scholarship, where the positive psychology movement, have you heard about that, positive psychology? No, good, wow, okay, uh, we'll start from there. Okay. So, psychology for 50 years was known for its focus on pathology, negativity, disease, dysfunction, despair, distress, disappointment, divorce, all the terrible Ds, right? And about a dozen years ago or so, the president of the American Psychological Association, one of the largest organizations of its type, said, enough of that. We need to shift our focus towards studying not the worst things in life, but the best things in life, all right? Disease, depression, despair, that's fine. We, we've got to eradicate those, right? And we've got a lot of treatments, psychological treatments, <coughs> uh, pharmacological treatments that can reduce depression, reduce some of the other mental illnesses but that doing so doesn't necessarily make a person function better, be happier, uh, have a greater sense of zest for life or purpose for life. Right? What about all these positive things, things like flourishing and excellence and virtue and things that make life worth living? He said, we've got to study those. We've got to learn who are the happy people and how do they get to be happy and what impact does it make? Why does it matter? that we were happy. Well, it turns out happiness drives various positive outcomes just like gratitude does. And so the organizational psychologist said, let's take positive psychology, let's bring it into the workplaces, and let's find out how to, how to make positive leaders and how, what effect that would have. So there's three domains to positive organizational functioning. There's positive emotions, things like joy, happiness, purpose, hope, gratitude. There's positive connections, relationships, you know, building community between individuals. 
and positive meanings. Uh, I think the concept of passion that Mr. Zaleski spoke of uh, to this group back in March fits in right there, the notion of deriving positive sense of meaning from one's job, seeing one's job, one's career as a calling and not just a way to um, get a paycheck, for example. Well, gratitude is involved in all three of these because gratitude is a positive emotion which leads to other positive feelings. Gratitude is involved in fostering positive connections between people because it's a relationship building emotion. When you feel grateful towards someone, you express that. That changes the relationship between you and that other person. And then gratitude is a way of deriving a sense of meaning. When you see your job, you see it as an opportunity, as a potential gift, and other people as providing you with benefits, and you have the opportunity to provide them with benefits, that adds a layer of meaning to it that makes possible by this notion of gratefulness, all of which are involved in creating positive functioning in that organization, what they call capability building, leading to optimal functioning. Okay? Uh, the notion of positive deviance is a shift from a, a baseline, kind of a homeostatic level. Again, in psychology, it always focused on negative deviance. When a person is depressed, it means their mood has gone south, right? From, a, let's say, a zero point, which is neutral, to a minus 10 would be very depressed. Well, you can get them back up to a zero through some combination <laughs> of psychotherapy, group therapy, drug therapies, right? But why, why stop at zero? Why not go to three or seven or nine? Well, you need other techniques because you can, you can eliminate or reduce negativity, such as depression, through these techniques, but that doesn't necessarily build in happiness, joy, well-being, a sense of purpose, things toward the positive pole on that spectrum. So it would be with organizational functioning. So they've begun to identify some of the effects, potential effects of gratitude within organizational life. Now, a lot of this is preliminary. We don't have the same numbers as we do for some of the individual effects of gratitude, which again range from 10% to about 30% differences in some of those outcomes, positive moods, health benefits, sleep, et cetera. Here, it's a little bit more uh, of a promissory note, kind of starting to do research on this topic but it's not really systematic as of now. But we know from research on happiness in the workplace and positive emotions that positive emotions make a difference for employee, job satisfaction, engagement, loyalty, so they don't start you know, going from job to job, customer retention, don't you want customers to be happy, to be grateful, fosters loyalty, citizenship behavior. Okay. Things like, you know, absenteeism, reducing that, uh, not stealing things from the business and bringing them home, and so on. Well, gratitude is involved in all of these, right? And some have been documented, some are being studied right now. Profitability, productivity, employability. An interesting study was just published showing that when people were trained to become more emotionally competent, you've heard the term emotional intelligence, right? Everybody knows emotional intelligence, one of the types of intelligence is right? very important for interpersonal success. Well, there's programs to train people to become more emotionally competent, to become skilled at recognizing emotions in other people, to become skilled at expressing emotions toward other people, becoming more empathic, uh, and so on. When people are trained to become more emotionally competent, they actually become more employable. Okay? They had human relations people look at videotapes of those who had been in this training program trying to solve a hypothetical problem. What would happen in your workplace if there was this issue that came up and they were asked to give you know, potential solution to that? Those who were trained to become more emotionally competent, which included becoming aware of gratitude and expressing gratefulness, were seen by that human relations expert as potentially more employable. They said, yeah, I'd be more likely to hire that person. And of course, they didn't know they had been in this study, but there was just an effect of learning to express and experience emotions more accurately and more consistently. So that's another good thing. So there's, you know, again, it's probably a limited, unlimited list of potential benefits of gratitude within organizational life. Now I'll tell you about some research which I think is pretty interesting, showing that gratitude pays off. Right? You may have heard of uh, some of this. They did a, a study in restaurants. Have you ever noticed how when a server will write thank you uh, before they give you the check? Sometimes they make a little smiley face and sometimes a big smiley face. Uh, you know, and so on. Okay. 
Well, they compared those checks that had a thank you written on them, which those compared to those that did not. And it turned out that the tips were 11% larger okay, when they wrote thank you on it compared to when they didn't, suggesting there's some rewarding or reinforcing when you are thanked. You want to do something in exchange for that. Right? This was interesting. I found this one. They added up the bill, and then they gave a discount for well-behaved kids. It looks like a 5% uh, discount, so that was kind of uh, interesting. Uh, anyway, so pays off uh, in that case, 11%. Is there a charge for bad kids? Bad kids, uh, extra charge, double, right? <laughs> they found another study, listen, customers of a jewelry store, all right, who received a telephone call to thank them for their business, spent more in the store during the next month than did customers who did not receive a call. He's calling them up and thanking them uh, for their business. But what was really interesting was that customers who were called and thanked and also told that there was going to be a sale next month actually did not spend more. Okay. Uh, it was thought that was kind of too, what, strategic. You know, oh, I want to thank you for, for your, you know, your, your loyalty. Oh, by the way, we're going to have this sale, you know, uh, come on back uh, kind of deal. So um, was not seen as effective in that case, suggesting that, you know, expressions of gratitude, of course, have to be sensitive to context and to uh, appropriateness. Uh, kind of interesting. Oh, this study I like. Uh, this was a study of Texas wineries. Now, you might think that's an oxymoron, but in fact... Anybody here from Texas? Okay. Uh, Texas, yeah, uh, number five, the fifth uh, number five state in terms of uh, grape growing and wine production. Okay, so it, in fact, it's a $183 billion industry in uh, Texas. $500 million in tourism is spent on Texas uh, wineries. Okay. So they did a study where they looked at how much people spent, how much money people spent on wine and on souvenirs in the gift shop, okay, based on how much gratitude they felt uh, when they were visiting the winery. The notion is, why do people buy the wine? Okay, well, there's obvious reasons. It tastes good, right? You know, they might like it. Okay, that's a pretty good reason, right? The cost. Uh, but one of the factors is in exchange for, you know, they, they're given a tour, right? They're given free tastings and so on. So you feel a little sense of, you know, kind of commitment. Well, okay, they've done all this for me. Uh, I'll at least buy a bottle, right? Because uh, it just doesn't feel right to get all this stuff in exchange and not do anything in return. So that may be one of the uh, reasons, factors influencing wine purchasing uh, behavior. Okay. So they found that the higher the visitor's feelings of gratitude, they had specific questions to measure how grateful did you feel when you were visiting the winery, when you were in the tasting room, on the tour, uh, and so on? That was related to how much money they spent on wine and souvenirs in the tasting room. Okay, now how much difference did it make? Well, it turned out it made quite a bit. Okay, so in this table, you have low level of gratitude, high level of gratitude. Okay, this is the amount spent on wine. Almost three times as much was spent on wine by the people who felt more gratitude. So, I mean, why wouldn't you want to know this if you were a winery, right? And try to get people to feel more gratitude or create the conditions in which it's possible for them to experience and express gratitude compared to those who had a low level, 13.68. So, you know, that's probably about six bottles of Texas wine, I imagine, <laughs> over here. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> and then how about on souvenirs, two and a half, so whatever you get for two and a half dollars, uh, you know, and then a 5.86. So overall, almost three times the amount for those with a high level of gratitude compared to those who had a low level of gratitude. So gratitude matters, right, for how much gratitude pays off. Okay, this was interesting too. When they looked at the association between gratitude and whether they had to pay or not for the tastings, Right. When I first moved to California, this was 1988, um, I was in Michigan at the time, and I had no idea where Davis was. Okay, so I pulled out a map, you know, of California, and I found Davis, 
and I saw like San Francisco and Lake Tahoe and Yosemite and Napa Valley. And you know, I thought this might be okay. You know, you get to a lot of places from there. So Napa Valley is like 45 minutes from Davis, right? And it turns out most of the uh, winemakers got their degree in winemaking, viticulture, and enology from Davis, which is interesting also. So I would often go and we had relatives and friends would come up and visit, uh, as they often do when you first move to a place that has interesting places to visit. And so most of the wineries in those days didn't charge you uh, for wine, you know? And then I got busy with work and a family had kids and stuff and it didn't go back for a couple of decades. And then went back for a wedding anniversary a couple of years ago and one thing I noticed was that now you had to pay for everything. You had to pay for, you know, uh, tasting and so on, especially at the larger uh, wineries. Well, it turns out that makes a difference for gratitude. And gratitude makes a difference for how much people buy. So you're thinking if they charge for tasting, people are going to buy less, right? I don't know if they made that connection or not. But here is paid fee for wine tasting, free wine tasting, Gratitude much higher, 3.98, 3.24. That's a huge difference because it's a five-point scale. I mean, that's almost a 20% difference there. <laughs> For those who received the wine free, created more feeling. You've been given a gift, right? If you're, if you're paying for the tasting, it's not a gift. But if you're given it free, you feel gratitude. The grateful people, much more likely to buy the wine. So why would you charge for it if you're trying to sell wine? I don't know. Maybe somebody can answer that. I guess they make money on it, no doubt, but still. Interesting, showing that gratitude matters in a very practical way that you can easily quantify through a study like this. All right, state of Louisiana did an uh, interesting study a few years ago after Hurricane Katrina. They took out a series of ads, billboards and radio spots all around the state to thank people, people who helped out with the rebuilding after Katrina to see if it impacted on the state's tourism uh, business and found that uh, the more people were exposed to these ads, the more likely they were to come back and spend money on tourism. In fact, they found that every 10 exposures to the state thank you ad increased one and a half percentage points a respondent's willingness to travel to Louisiana. And I think one and a half percent is not that big, but the tourism industry is $9 billion in Louisiana. So one and a half percent, right? We're talking about $90 million, right? So from, from these exposures. So again, gratitude has a practical, concrete payoff when it's expressed, whether it's in, by the jewelry store, in the winery, by a, a state program for tourism. It has impact. It, it affects people in a, conc a concrete, measurable way. But yet we got this problem here. We have this gap, this discrepancy. And this is a quote from a, a blogger that I have in my book. He says, almost everyone I know, from pastors to parents, cashiers to carpet cleaners, architects to accounts, suffers from GDD, gratitude deficit disorder. Despite all our good intentions and actions, we receive much more flack than gratitude. We are hungry for genuine appreciation and thanks. We want to know that we matter, that our efforts are making the world a better place, right? We saw that from those statistics, right? Two thirds of people saying they want more gratitude, they're not receiving it, there's this gap, there's this uh, discrepancy. Uh, so what can be done about it? Well, here's a question for you, for audience participation time. Right? People know gratitude is good, right? People say they're grateful, most people would say they're grateful individuals but yet they don't feel they're receiving enough gratitude, right? People say that there's this gratitude deficit disorder. So that suggests there's something that's getting in the way. There's some obstacles. There's some blocks to gratitude. So what do you think one or two of those might be? Why is this, this huge discrepancy between what is the case and what should be the case? Got to give to receive. Got to give to receive. Okay, so it starts with just not enough ex ex appreciation, leads to less appreciation, right? Yeah, I think it starts with yourself. Yeah. Okay. Attitude? Right. Attitude, okay. What kind of attitude might block? Just, well, just some people's positions in their workplace that they're, they're not happy. They kind of get an attitude and, and just get on a flat yeah. plane and never go anywhere. Okay, so kind of pervasive negative attitude yeah. in the first place, right? Doesn't, in the back? Lack of awareness or being isolated from what's happening around you. 
Okay, so not having that connection with what's going on around you. So yeah, it's hard to see maybe the, the connection of the roles other people are applying and different things happening to you. Yeah, what else? Technology, how so? We're less engaged with others during the day. Email, texting, yeah. uh, kids with video games, social media, mm -hmm. big antisocial social. It's hard, hard to see the contributions uh, because you just, yeah, you get absorbed in the immediacy of the device itself, right? And kind of lose the, less that it's, a, that it's, uh, what was a means to an end becomes an end in itself. Yeah, I safer. think so. It's safer not to express gratitude? No, it's safer, oh, the, with, to his the, point, yeah. it's safer to communicate with a device. There's no, there's no rejection with a device. It does what you want it to do as long as you either enter the correct information or you make it communicate the way you want it to. So you tend to develop a relationship with whatever device you're using or whether it's a social media or Whatever the case may be, you can manipulate that to the response that you want to get. Yeah, yeah. Rick? I've, I've experienced that in an organization there are no models. That the leadership doesn't model that. And they model something else, and they're going to do that. So starting from the top down, right? Because that they create the climate of what's expected, the norms. They set the tone of the culture. Yeah. And if you're in a, in a culture, an environment where you're uh, focused on fixing what is wrong all the time, I mean, almost by nature, if the role requires that, uh, it's going to be hard to look for positivity, right, to express gratitude if you're trying to put out fires or focus on what's wrong all the time. So, you know, a lot of organizations, I mean, UC Davis, good example, right, academia is kind of this culture of complaint. I mean, we're trained as scientists to find out what's wrong. You know, what's wrong in this study? What's wrong in this article? As an editor, what's wrong? Why, why should I reject this article from being published? You know, not what's good about it. And so we just kind of aimed in that direction from the start. I think in business, a lot of businesses focus on the bottom line. And if, if again, that's kind of coming from the top, there isn't going to be, um, you know, the relational dynamics happening within an organization amongst colleagues as well as with customers. If you're just focused on the bottom line, you're not going to to be grateful for you know maybe having the job right. to the point of the survey at the beginning. Right. Of this it's just seen as irrelevant. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or some uh, or uh, a weakness. Or uh, I think that's a big part of it too. We why the why the men in this study and all the studies on gratitude find that men are more gratitude challenged. It's not that they're ungrateful. Just relative to women, they they always score lower. And they just tend to have less of a positive attitude toward it. They believe that it indicates that they have to depend upon other people. Because gratitude implies a dependency. You know, I can't do this myself. I need your help. Who wants to admit to that? Right? I mean, that's kind of an inadequacy and so on. So, yeah, so there's lots of things that, that get in the way of it. Uh, potentially uh, are reasons why we have this discrepancy between what is and what could be, potentially in an organization that covets gratitude and is known as a gratitude producing or gratitude generating organization. Okay, you know, I've, I think a lot of it is also about remembering and I've I mentioned this a couple of times uh, in writing my book that gratitude is really about memory. It's about remembering to remember. Remembering why we receive what we receive. How many people are responsible for helping us get where we are today because nobody got here by their own efforts, totally, right? There's been other people, there's been teachers, there's been co-workers, uh, bosses, etc. Uh, and then it's remembering those. So there's a, there's a little paradox there. There's an irony is that memory is what makes us human. Right? Our memories are what make us individuals, give us our identity, our own personality. We all have different memories of different experiences. But we're also very forgetful people, right? And so there's that paradox that we have to engage in practices that help us to remember before we can have this amount of gratitude. So uh, some of the practices that have been developed focus on this notion of becoming more consciously and de deliberately mindful of trying to remember, trying to be less forgetful. One of these is gratitude journaling. And this actually is a good time, this would be a great time in fact, to flip through the handout. 
because oh somewhere around the second to last page there's like four pages uh, stapled together there's a page that looks like this it's 10 prescriptions for becoming more thankful this comes from my earlier book thanks uh, the first one is keeping a gratitude journal and that's a uh, technique which has been refined over the years we now know what works and what doesn't work when it comes to gratitude journaling and so there are a lot of ways to journal for gratitude it's one of the best ways to intentionally and intentionally practice gratitude and these are just some tips about doing so some people keep a journal and they do so at the end of the day they'll go home and they'll write down five things today that went well that they're grateful for or three things or they might start more generally by saying okay what are three good things that happened today okay the practice of three counting your blessings three things that went well recently okay uh, I drove here from Davis and there was no traffic right? uh, I found the way here without having to use Siri on the iPhone you know who it's kind of annoying and I get distracted a lot when I listen to her so I just uh, I printed it out and then I studied the uh, directions and I remember where to turn and so on so you know you don't normally feel gra grateful for those things but it's just a way of attaching the label of gratitude to good things happening you start to develop a gratitude consciousness you start to look at things through a grateful lens of appreciation it changes how you view them right? it's really fascinating the way it works and that's what I found out after doing this for 12 years myself someone who'd always been gratitude challenged and that's how I came to study this and you know we do that as psychologists we tend to take what we're bad at and try to get better at it you know so I have people who are very um, disagreeable and kind of uh, negative toward others so they study forgiveness you know because they want to get better at it I am other people are kind of shy and introverted and they, they study like assertiveness right because they want to get better at it and people are forgetful they study memory and there's a long history of you know kind of this trying to improve your deficiencies and so it was me with the gratitude so you know people will say well tell me you're such an expert on gratitude my wife says this all the time and I've shared this before she said how you're supposed to be this expert you write these books you give these talks and and you're like the least grateful person I know is what she tells me you know, I said I don't you know I think you need to know more people because yeah, a lot of people are not so grateful but that's, that's what the survey says right uh, and so on but it's a good point we need to work on it and uh, it doesn't come easily or naturally to people I, I've uh, I'm convinced of that so we need these practices like gratitude journaling that's just one of them there's like nine others right so you could begin there but it wouldn't end there another good one is to write a letter of thanks to someone what's known as the gratitude letter you identify someone in your life past or present whom you've never really properly taken the time to thank and then you write them a letter following these instructions you take a time uh, at least a page long and you make it special right you, you, you kind of put it in some sort of format which will be um, sustainable like laminate it and so on and then you actually present it to that person you make an appointment to go see them don't just send them a quick email but actually you know write this letter say I want to visit with you there's something I want to tell you and so on and you present them with this letter it's a very emotional uh, meeting as you might expect but actually impacts the health and well-being of both people but especially the writer the sender up to six months later they show a measurable increase in happiness levels and decrease in depression levels for people just by this one letter this one visit so the gratitude letter is a very effective way and easy for organizations to incorporate that into their uh, practices the gratitude letter sharing letters with with each other uh, the book gratitude uh, works should we tell them they're going to get a copy of that is this a good time to do that sure. okay so uh, so on the way out there's copies of my book gratitude works for you to take uh, with you and the cornerstone of the book are the seven daily practices for developing gratitude and if you don't want to do it yourself that's fine hand it to somebody who you think should be more grateful whether it's an <laughs> office mate or co-worker or teenage son or spouse or whatever say do I have a book for you right? uh, and so on and so I have seven practices I have a, it's a 21 day program where you implement one of these a day for a week and then you repeat them on week two and week three and by the end of three weeks uh, you start to see measurable actually before then for a lot of people measurable changes uh, in psychological health relationships all those things we talked about earlier from the 21 day program of putting gratitude into practice okay this all so the top 10 actually has the list the top 10 prescriptions 
I have it up here on the slide. One of the good ones is just having a visual reminder or a cue because we get distracted. So here's where technology actually is a benefit, not uh, an obstacle to gratitude. You know, I'm so grateful that I can connect with so many people who I don't even actually know on Facebook, but you know, they're friends, right, in some respects. And so uh, it's kind of cool. So you can actually have a gratitude app, for example, uh, on your phone. There's lot, all kinds of gratitude journaling apps which have been found to be very useful and effective and can stop you and signal you at different times of the day and you can program in or type in your, your gratitudes. It's a way to do it that helps you remember, helps us deal with that obstacle of, of um, forgetting things that we're grateful for. There's other ones as well, but it just makes it more concrete, more real, uh, less abstract. Okay, so what it comes down to at the end, I think, is making a decision or choice to be grateful. It's no particular personality who is predisposed. You don't inherit a grateful gene, uh, you know, from your uh, parents or grandparents. It's really something that there's a lot of control over, something that can be practiced uh, and sustained, but it has to be implemented and it has to be intentionally practiced over time before it becomes more automatic, before it becomes more of a habit, like, any, like physical exercise, you know. It's got to be practiced on a regular basis. It has to be a choice. And I like to share the story of this individual who was a 49-year-old man with neuromuscular disease, an advanced form of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And he got to the point in his life where the, the disease had drained most of the movement out of his body, uh, confined to bed and so forth, and he's not expected to live much longer. And I think he knew that the end was near, so he calls his wife uh, to his bedside and his two daughters as well, because he has something he wants to tell them. And this is what he said. He said, I want you to write this down. Okay. He says, I believe life is not always fair. It has certainly been the case uh, for me. And you think, oh, he's going to start you know, complaining. Why me? Why all this bad stuff happen? But instead he says this, it's not fair that I should have had two wonderful, caring, supportive parents who raised me right and brothers and sisters that are there when I need them. It's not fair that I should be blessed with a beautiful, talented wife and we should have two equally beautiful, talented daughters who make us proud daily. No, he said, life is not fair. Why should I have had so many good years of good health and energy and good friends to camp and go backpack with uh, through the years? ALS is a terrible disease, but it does not negate the rest of my life. Right? And that was this decision, the stance that he made, right, to look at life through this lens of gratitude, died two weeks after this, uh, after he left this, this note behind, his legacy, is what he wanted to be known for. He could have made, obviously, a lot of different choices. The direction could have gone a different way than it did. But for him, it was almost like this defiant gratitude that despite all the stuff happening to me, I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to choose gratitude uh, in spite, not because of what's going on, but in spite of what's going on. I just find this very inspiring way to live which obviously goes way beyond listing a few things on your gratitude journal every day. That's a good place to start, but gratitude has got to go deeper to become more of a trait or disposition to really impact people, to impact our own lives and lives of people we interact with. It's got to become more a core aspect of who we are. Let me end with <clears throat> one additional quote coming from someone who knew, certainly knew tri uh, trials, suffering, uh, adversity in the Nazi concentration camps, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, if you read his diaries, his letters from prison, they're just saturated with the language of gratitude and thanks and thankfulness and so on. And he says this, In ordinary life, we receive a great deal more than we give and that it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. Uh, I think that's a, it's a good perspective and it's one which, you know, we can put into practice, right? If we apply some of these principles and we start to reap some of the benefits a grateful living. Um, so I thank you very much for your attention. It's been great, you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.